You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is episode 65, covering the week of March 27th through March 31st, 2017. Glad to have you back on your pro- on the program. I'm your host, Brian McClanahan. And we've got a, a lot of good stuff to talk about this week. First and foremost, so let's do some housekeeping before we get there. Uh, remember that we exist on your tax-deductible contributions alone. If you would like to help us explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition, please consider a tax-deductible contribution to the Abbeville Institute. Uh, you can find that information on www.abbevilleinstitute.org at the top of the page under support. Memberships for individuals. We also have uh, memberships for businesses and uh, some uh, other options that you could do if you would like to contribute in different ways. You, of course, can provide an annual membership or a monthly membership. We have those options, so please consider that. Also, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, like our YouTube page. Uh, Think about attending one of our conferences. Our summer school uh, takes place this July. July 9th through 14th, 2017, in Seabrook Island, South Carolina. We have a great topic. We have very few slots left, so if you are considering going to the summer school, you might want to contact Dr. Livingston now and get on board with that. You can find that information on our website as well. Right in the middle of the page, there's a little thing that says you're invited. Click on that link, and it'll give you all the information about the summer school. So uh, it's a grand time. We'd like to see you there. And I believe in the fall we're going to have another conference, so I can't say that definitively, but um, I think that's going to happen. So look for that, too, as we uh, get that information out there. Okay, that said, all of that thing, all that stuff that we got to do at the beginning of the uh, program, uh, let's talk about our articles for the week. So we had, uh, of course, our five articles for the week, and uh, there was a general theme to this, and that is Yankees. Um, and it didn't seem that way at first, but um, uh, because we started off the week with an article on Thomas Jefferson and slavery, and this particular article by Dave Benner was uh, somewhat based on uh, Kevin Gutzman's book on Jefferson, his new book, uh, and um, we talked about that book last week. But uh, I, I think where it fits into Yankees is the perception of Jefferson. And it's the treasury of counterfeit virtue, which we've talked about on this podcast a number of times. But uh, generally, it comes down to this: you know, the perception of Jefferson, and and the first and the last piece of the week fit into this narrative as of well. Paul Yarborough's piece, "Why Lee, Why Acton," which was published on Friday. The perception of Jefferson is that we can't really like Thomas Jefferson because the man was a slaveholder, and so when we start talking about the politically correct attacks on the South, and we had a whole conference on that. You have to start looking at a broader perspective here. And I remember when I was interviewed for the Christian Science Monitor about this topic, you know, I said, and this was this was a while back uh, when this all this uh, started, uh, well over a year ago. I said, you know, where do you stop if you if you uh, take down statues of Lee and Beauregard like they're doing in uh, in New Orleans, uh, or you take down uh, take your pick, take down a statue of Lee in Virginia. Uh, wherever you're you're looking at, where do you stop? Do you just stop with Lee, or do you go after other Southerners as well who also own slaves, uh, who obviously don't fit the politically correct narrative, people like Thomas Jefferson or even George Washington? Do you attack them? Uh, I think that what we have is selective outrage in the United States. Or do you go after statues of Ponce de Leon uh, in Florida, who uh, was a notorious slave trader and slave owner? But, of course, nobody talks about that. Uh, do you go after uh, any uh, memorials to, uh, say, Cherokee Indians or Creek Indians because, lo and behold, they were slave owners? Uh, I mean, where where do you stop? Do you stop eating chocolate? Uh, because chocolate, even to this day, is produced on plantations that primarily use a labor system that is very close to slave labor. I mean, you might even might as well just call it that. Do we stop eating Hershey bars? Uh, I mean, these are the things you have to wonder. I mean, do we stop? Do we tear down? The pyramids in Egypt, uh, you know, if you just look overseas, or we stop talking about Egyptian history, or maybe we stop talking about Roman history because, my gosh, these people were slave owners. Do we stop reading Aristotle because uh, Aristotle was uh, openly favorable to slavery in, in Athens? Do we stop doing these things because they are hurting our sensibilities? Uh, so we have selective outrage, and 
unfortunately, I mean, there, there was another thing I saw the other day. You know, some guy uh, uses the uh, Confederate battle flag as his uh, little avatar there on social media, and people say that flag is un-American. Well, this is where we've gotten to, that somehow a purely American symbol like, in, like the Confederate battle flag, which for many Americans for generations has been viewed as nothing more than a symbol of defiance or pride, uh, where I mean, now it's become an un-American symbol. That flag that was flown in Germany when there was German reification on the table and people were talking about the end of communism in East Germany, uh, there were East Germans flying the Confederate battle flag or there were uh, Chinese flying it in Tiananmen Square as a symbol of defiance or liberty. Uh, so now in America, it's un-American. And this is, this is so preposterous. But uh, when you get back to the issue of Jefferson... Uh, Benner points out that you know Jefferson was uh, really a man for his time. I mean, there's there's, um, there's nothing about Jefferson that's not in regard to race that's not uh, you know symbolic of the time or typical for the time. Uh, Jefferson did think that, uh, like Washington and Randolph, that uh, slavery was uh, not a very good institution; that uh, it was a burden for those that had it, and he thought about. Uh, ways to manumit his slaves, just like George Washington and John Randolph of Roanoke did, uh, but that financially he couldn't afford to do so by the time he died because of some debts and some other problems that he had. So that's why Jefferson didn't manumit his slaves. And so this selective outrage at Jefferson, well, you said you were against slavery, yet you didn't free your slaves. And that's exactly what Benner is getting into in this piece, why he didn't free his slaves when he died, because his estate couldn't afford it. Uh, they had He had too many debts to pay and uh, would have been impossible to do so. Um, so he, he's going after this again, this uh, treasury of counterfeit virtue that the North has, and uh, you know the self righteousness that uh, oftentimes Northern historians and others will, will parade about. You know, well, uh, I'm I'm so I'm in I'm against slavery in 2017. Well, that's an easy position to take in 2017. It was much more uh, much more complex in uh, 1826. Uh, or at another period of time in American history. It's easy to say these things looking back, but uh, if you're put into the time period, uh, the situation became much more complex, I think, for for many people involved. Uh, and so uh, the, we'll, we'll skip to the Friday piece because it kind of fits in that narrative. You know, Yarbrough's piece, Why Lee, Why Acton? And he points out again that, you know, Jefferson and uh, others were in favor of colonization, uh, Abraham Lincoln was in favor of colonization. And so why is it that Lincoln is given this huge memorial? As we've talked about in this podcast again, too, why is Lincoln given a huge memorial in Washington, D.C., when the man was an ardent racist? And I know that uh, it was funny. I was at a conference uh, on Saturday, this past Saturday in uh, in Alabama, and Tom DiRenzo gave a talk, and he was talking about Doris Kearns Goodwin's uh, book on uh, Lincoln, that uh, was the basis of the Spielberg movie, uh, Lincoln. And she said in that book that, she, that historians have, have searched, combed the record for uh, some type of evidence that uh, Lincoln was a racist, and they can find nothing. And, of course, that is such a that, that statement shows that Goodwin didn't do any research and that simply she is trying to prop up this Lincoln myth. But Lincoln made a number of statements. And so DiLorenzo, of course, wrote a piece where he just started writing these things out, where here's what Lincoln said this, Lincoln said that. Lincoln uh, never believed that blacks and whites were equal. So should we tear down uh, the Lincoln Memorial? Or maybe we should recontextualize it and start putting up all these statements that Lincoln said about the inferiority of black Americans. Uh, maybe that would, um, would change the, the perspective on the Lincoln myth. But again, this is that treasure, treasury of counterfeit virtue that Northerners are somehow bold and noble and good and Southerners are just evil and backwards. Uh, and... He, he wonders why uh, people don't get the full picture. Uh, well, of course, we all know why, it's, uh, and he knows why. It's, it's political correctness run amok, and it's, again, this idea of selective outrage. Well, Southerners are the, easy, they're the, they're the low-hanging fruit to criticize in America for all things that ail the United States. And um, I think the, the finger should be pointed back at the North, which is uh, you know, why we had a couple of other pieces this week that talk about that very topic. You know, is it the South that really was the problem, or is it something else? Or is it the North that really was the problem uh, in this process, in this time leading up to the war, and then after the war? I mean, you can look at problems in the 20th century, 
problems uh, in, uh, you know, with foreign policy or domestic policy. I think you can point your finger right back at the North in many ways as either the godfather of some of the solutions to these problems that are often seen as so uh, dangerous or despicable, uh, and also uh, the North as being uh, the driving force behind various uh, policies that have uh, the federal government used to solve issues. I mean, even if it didn't, if the South was using the same solution, but the North was actually the driving force in doing it. So uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but on um, Tuesday, we ran a piece by Joyce Bennett. And Joyce Bennett is a, a very good author. She's written a wonderful book on Maryland, which I think is uh, published through Shotwell Press now. Uh, but she wrote a little uh, little piece entitled Maryland's Confederate Sisterhood. And of course, April is supposed to be uh, Women's History Month. Uh, so we have that uh, that coming up. And, no, I'm sorry. April, March was Women's History Month. April, April of course, is Confederate uh, History Month, but uh, you won't hear that in the mainstream press. So April, uh, March is supposed to be Women's History Month. So uh, she points out that you know, oftentimes the people that are uh, championed during Women's History Month uh, when it comes to the war in Maryland were carpetbaggers, essentially. People like Clara Barton, who was from Massachusetts, uh, and uh, Barbara Fritchie, uh, and Matilda Sterling. Uh, these are people that are often said, you know, these are, these are people who are run out as these great uh, heroines from Maryland because they were good women behind the Union. And people like uh, Rose Greenhow uh, are ignored or just uh, infamously uh, tarred and feathered as uh, you know, uh, Confederate uh, sympathizers, or uh, recently Greenhow has been pointed out whether she was just doing this uh, because she was uh, she was just spying on the Union because this was saving her own hide. Uh, uh, she was actually a Yankee uh, and and uh, sympathetic the Confederacy out of venal self interest, a turncoat, uh, and so. But that that wasn't really the case, as as Bennett points out. You know, uh, Greenhow really was interested in in the South. She was very good friends with John C. Calhoun. Um, she had a, uh, a vested interest in the Southern cause in that she believed Maryland should have gone with the South. Um, and so I, I think that this is, this is the issue nowadays. You know, we're recontextualizing everything. And I think that's, that's the new catchphrase. We're recontextualizing. Uh, and that's what modern historians want to do with everything. They want to take a Confederate monument. They don't want to tear it down. They simply want to recontextualize it. Uh, that means erase, <laughs> erase it and say, or at least leave it there as a symbol of you know, hatred or whatever they want to say it is. Um, I know at one case in South Carolina, uh, you had some people running around talking about uh, these monuments and how various aspects of the monuments were designed to show male supremacy. Uh, not just white male supremacy, but just male supremacy in general because of the broad uh, the broad shoulders of the figures or the emphasis on the groin or whatever the case may be, uh, that this was actually designed to show that, uh, you know, this was, this was to, to show uh, other South Carolinians who were either female or of a, of a different race that white men are supreme and uh, you better get over it. Uh, so this is, this is the kind of thing that we're running into in the modern era. Uh, I, and it's it's silly. I remember, um, and and thankfully the the professor who I won't name uh, was uh, using this to make fun of the situation. But uh, in one article uh, in, in graduate school years ago, uh, we had to read about slave hairstyles as a form of resistance. And uh, this professor um, assigned this article because of how preposterous this was. And this guy wasn't uh, a Southern sympathizer. Uh, he wasn't uh, someone who was a quote-unquote neo-Confederate. Uh, he just simply wanted to show how bad the historical profession had gotten. That uh, they're going so far as to say the way that uh, someone you know styled their hair showed resistance to the to the system of slavery. Uh, there was no evidence. It was just well, this is what I think, and so that's what I'm going to do with this. Uh, just like there's really no evidence in any of this other stuff. This recontextualization. Uh, that this was these things were put up uh, because people wanted to show that uh, you know white Southerners were supreme. Maybe it just had to do with the fact that they were very proud thirty years later 
of uh, their their lineage and what these people had done, as the Confederate monument in uh, in, Col- in uh, Columbus, Georgia says. You know, this was uh, done to uh, uh, perpetuate the sovereignty of the states. It says it right on the monument. Uh, that's why they're they're interested in uh, rekindling the spirit of the 1860s and before. Um, and it says it, why they're doing it, right on the monument. Maybe we should just read the monuments, um, you know, dedicated to the Confederate soldier who uh, sacrificed. Uh, and there was a supreme sacrifice here for many men, not just death, but, of course, uh, the, the, um, the way the South was abused during the war, the sacrifices that women made during the war. Um, you know, when we look at the American War for Independence and the things that women had to go through in that particular period and, and the deprivations they had, they paled in comparison to the deprivations that Southern women had on the home front uh, during the war. I mean, there was, you couldn't get anything, really. Uh, and so I, I was reading a book the other day and, and um, about life on the Mississippi uh, during the war. And there was, well, it's not just about that. There's a chapter on that. And this author, who's now dead, I uh, just died a couple of years ago, but uh, it's, a, it's wonderful. The, the book is wonderfully written. It's a great narrative, but he gets in the fact that, you know, Southerners uh, were just depriving themselves on purpose. They could have had these things, particularly in the Mississippi area, because uh, a lot of the area was open uh, to trade. Uh, but So they could have had goods that they wanted, but they chose not to. Now, if you think about that, if that's true, if they were just choosing not to have these things, and they said they chose not to have them because the men in the field were facing hardships and deprivation. Well, then what does that say about the women on the home front? How dedicated were they to the cause? This actually flies in the face of people like uh, Drew Gilpin Faust and others who you know, said that the women weren't really that dedicated. Or uh, nowadays, in, in, uh, and again in Columbus, Georgia, they just erected a, a uh, historic marker talking about the women's riot uh, that took place. Uh, in that time because these women were ticked off because they didn't have any food and they were blaming the Confederate leadership. They really weren't that dedicated to the cause. So if these women were actually willing in areas to not have these things because others in the South couldn't have these things, what does that say about their dedication? It says it's complete uh, and that we shouldn't go out and recontextualize or put up stupid historical markers uh, saying that, well, this, all, this is all just hogwash, this, this myth of Southern solidarity, or this myth of uh, of uh, the lost cause. Uh, that's what this is all about. Maybe not. Maybe there was something real and concrete to it. Uh, but we don't we don't often uh, you know uh, think that. Not in the political politically correct world of uh, modern recontextualization. So uh, Joyce Bennett does a very good job here of uh, bringing out these Confederate heroines, who they were. Uh, why they were important. Uh, she does a nice job with uh, with Greenhow. And, of course, Greenhow died, uh, drowned, trying to run the blockade. Uh, and so, uh, actually, uh, uh, Jefferson Davis um, and uh, the, the, the Davis administration paid $2,500 um, uh, for her service to the South. Um, so, it's it's uh it's interesting that uh, we we look at or Northerners now look at Greenhow as just this Yankee uh, who was uh, you know interested in in saving her own neck, whereas the South never looked at her that way. Uh, but there's others. Um, uh, Olivia Floyd she brings up uh, in this particular piece. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, she was a very important Marylander. Who was interested in the in the Southern cause? Uh, so uh, I think um, you know uh, Mrs. Goldsboro, who was a nurse uh, for the South. I think that um, when you go out and you look at Southern history, you'll find that there were a number of people uh, who were uh, so instrumental in the South, and it, it was women. Uh, I, I think that the Confederate soldier never forgot how important the women were on the home front, uh, and. Uh, in keeping things together. I mean, they could have easily said, you know what, we're not going to support this war anymore. The, the hardships we're facing are too much. Uh, we're just not going to do it. And if that ever happens, uh, you don't really have a sustainable war because if the population does not sustain it, support it, uh, you're going to run into problems because people will refuse to fight. Remember, 
Uh, most Confederate soldiers are volunteer. I know that they, they instituted a draft at one point, and, uh, but most Confederate soldiers were volunteer. So, uh, and this, of course, is, uh, you know, in this, uh, this has been brought up uh, because of the Newt Knight issue uh, in, in Mississippi and how many people were, uh, there was a draft. But, of course, as Ryan Walters has pointed out, you know, most people in Mississippi still volunteered. Uh, so uh, if you're not going to have a, a unified home front, well, then it's very hard to conduct a war. And uh, what uh, Joyce Bennett is pointing out here is that there was a unified home front in the South, even in places like Maryland, where they could have just simply said, you know what, we're not going to support this thing. But you still had uh, Southerners in Maryland and other places that were willing to put their neck on the line because they could be accused of being spies or traitors. Uh, and essentially, that's what Rose Greenhow was accused of doing. So uh, it, it's amazing how uh, we've, we've flipped the narrative so easily in America in the last, uh, really, it's, it's been only in the last uh, 30 years or so. Uh, even during the 60s, when some of the stuff started coming out, there was still a nice counterweight uh, to the history of the time and showing that, okay, well, I mean, we can, we can have this discussion, this very academic discussion about what Southerners were, what they weren't, uh, what they supported, what they didn't support. Uh, but nowadays, uh, simply coming out and, and saying anything that could be uh, considered pro-Southern is going to get you uh, just ripped apart in the mainstream. Uh, and a nice example of that is DiLorenzo, Tom DiLorenzo's piece, which was actually originally published at LewRockwell.com a couple of years ago, uh, entitled A Disease of the Public Mind. It goes over the book by Thomas Fleming, which is of that title, A Disease in the Public Mind, A New Understanding of Why We Fought the Civil War. And so Fleming took the very unpopular position, and Tom Fleming is a mainstream historian. Uh, he's been on PBS, NPR. I mean, he really is as mainstream as, as you can get. He's written biographies of George Washington and Ben Franklin. And this particular uh, book says that the reason we had a war is because in the North you had these rabid abolitionists who were pushing the North toward war. In the South, uh, which DiLorenzo doesn't get into, uh, you also have uh, where he said, well, the other thing is that uh, Southerners were worried about a race war. But DiLorenzo focuses on this idea of this, again, this treasury of counterfeit virtue, uh, that uh, the disease of the public mind is, is so convincingly destroying. Uh, in fact, this is what Fleming said in this book, quote, Northern hatred for Southerners long predated their objections to slavery. Abolitionists were convinced that New England, whose spokesmen had, whose spokesmen had begun the American Revolution, should have been the leaders of the new nation. Instead, they had been displaced by Southern slavocrats like Thomas Jefferson. This is entirely true. If you look at the Hartford Convention, and you look at uh, which took place during the War of 1812, and you look at what Northerners wanted, they wanted some constitutional amendments that would have essentially limited the political power of the South. And, of course, they didn't get it, but that's what the entire purpose of that was. It was to go after the South and limit their power. And Northerners have started talking about secession as early as 1794, when Oliver Ellsworth and uh, Rufus King pulled aside John Taylor of Caroline in the Senate cloakroom and said, look, John, this thing isn't working. We want out. What do you say? And John Taylor was shocked because they had just ratified the Constitution and just, uh, you know, just, uh, six years before that and just put the government into effect five years before that, the new government. So, uh, he didn't understand where this was coming from, but Northerners had a long-standing fear of Southern dominance of the government. Going back before the institution of slavery became such a front and center problem in America. Uh, you look at the election of Jefferson in 1800 uh, and how there were threats of secession if Jefferson was to win. They lo you look at uh, Northern threats of secession in 1803 and 04 after the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, you know, abolitionists have been talking about secession for years. In the 1840s, they really actively promoted it. Um, so uh, Fleming took a lot of heat for this. I remember reading the reviews on Amazon and how oh, Tom Fleming has dusted off a, an argument that's 100 years old. I'm glad. I mean, maybe it's as old as he is. Uh, we've moved beyond this now because we're much more enlightened nowadays. Um, and, you know, Fleming has the, has the uh, backbone to ask, why was the United States the only nation in the world to fight a war to end slavery? Why? Uh, this is a question that people have been asking for a long period of time. 
And he gets into the idea that John Brown somehow became Jesus Christ. Uh, and how this was such a, a strange thing. And so if you're going to have that, you have to take this seriously. Southerners did look at that and say, my gosh, these people are crazy in the North. You're going to elevate a man who was a homicidal maniac, who the first person that he killed was a black man. You're going to elevate this man, a homicidal maniac, to a saint? We're doomed. We're in real trouble in this union. Uh, and uh, and ab- as, as, uh, as DiLorenzo points out, and as Fleming points out, an abolitionist compatriot of Garrison's named Henry C. Wright declared that Jesus Christ was a dead failure for allowing slavery to exist and insisted that John Brown would be a power far more efficient than Christ. So when you, when you start talking this way uh, and you get this rhetorical attack and Southerners feel like they are being demonized, which they are, and they're going to uh, retre- they're going to entrench themselves and defend themselves, it's natural that you're going to have some type of hostility at some point. Uh, and so, uh, as, uh, as Clyde Wilson, we didn't have a Clyde Wilson piece this week because um, this piece did a nice job of talking about Clyde Wilson and his uh, Yankee problem in American history. And, uh, you know, as Clyde says, Hillary Rodham Clinton is a museum-quality specimen of the Yankee, self-righteous, ruthless, and self-aggrandizing. And uh, as he writes, uh, as Wilson writes, the North have been Yankeeized for the most part quietly by control of churches, schools, and other cultural institutions by whipping up a frenzy of paranoia about the alleged plot of the South to spread slavery into the North, Um, which just simply wasn't true. Uh, Even if you look at Calhoun made a wonderful speech on the admission of Michigan, where he said, look, you know, Michigan can decide what it wants to. It's a state. It's a state. Uh, But we don't often uh, look at it this way. Uh, It's just the slave power. And, of course, uh, Murray Rothbard said the same things. There are so many people that used to say these things that um, we we don't often read and take into account uh, because now they're just politically incorrect. They're this dark other side of history that we've we've been enlightened, so we're recontextualizing everything. And this even goes into foreign policy. And the last piece I want to talk about for the week is a piece that I wrote entitled Yankee Foreign Policy in the Cold War. And it it focuses on Dean Acheson, who was the mastermind of the Cold War. And Dean Acheson was from Connecticut. And uh, the the reason I wrote this is because, you know, we've got North Korea now rattling sabers, uh, talking about blowing up American aircraft carriers and goading Donald Trump into, uh, you know, into attacking North Korea potentially. Uh, and so we're, they're talking about a nuclear war with South Korea. And this happens about every 20 years. Um, but it's in the blood. But most, most Americans don't understand that the reason of this is because of the Cold War and because of Dean Acheson, who was uh, the mastermind of all this stuff. And Hillary, he once called Hillary Clinton a terrific person. Now, Acheson at, was point, at one point was uh, a man who was fairly soft on the Soviet Union. And uh, but he, he came to believe that you couldn't do that anymore, that you had to militarize the Cold War. And so when we start talking about the Cold War and looking at the tension in the Cold War, uh, Acheson was the man who was really behind that. Uh, before that, though, he gave us wonderful things like uh, the IMF, the World Bank, and GATT. Uh, and so when you look at some of our world financial problems, you can thank Dean Acheson for that. This is a guy that at one time was canned because um, he knew nothing about banking and finance. It can from a position the Secretary of, the Tre- of uh, uh, in the Treasury Department, I should say, because uh, he didn't know anything about finance. This was during the, the uh, Great Depression. But Acheson uh, was the architect of the Marshall Plan. Um, he was the architect, or at least favored the findings of NSC 68, which called for a massive, ex- massive expansion of both American military spending and the CIA. Um, he, um, he was the mastermind of the Truman Doctrine, which was uh, the basis of the Cold War. We have to contain communism where it already exists by any means necessary. And, of course, that led to our involvement in North Korea in 19, or at least I should say in Korea in 1950. And the containment doctrine eventually led to the domino theory, which got us involved in Vietnam and on down the line. It got us involved in the Middle East. So all of these things that we look at today 
these foreign policy brush fires that we have, whether it's Korea, whether it's Iran, whether it's Iraq, take your pick. This stuff all comes out of the Cold War. And the man who was behind it is Connecticut-born Dean Acheson. So we're living in a Yankee foreign policy. Now, it doesn't mean Southerners didn't buy into it, and they did. And as, this, as we put this piece on social media, we had people, Southerners, saying, well, yeah, but, I mean, the Soviets were bad guys. So we had to do something about that. So now we have to have base, military bases in 100 countries around the globe, and we have to have you know this treasury of counterfeit virtue, city upon a hill, foreign policy, where our job, supposedly, is to spread liberty and democracy to every corner of the world. This comes from Dean Acheson. And the policy shift really occurred right after the war uh, in 1866 when Americans started thinking, well, you know what, now if we've conquered these evil Southerners, let's go out and spread this type of uh, idea around the globe. In fact, the first event that really uh, showed this was there was some interest in Americans getting involved in the Crete independence movement in Crete. Now, what that has to do with American interests, I have no idea. And no one knew, and we didn't do it. But there was serious discussion about uh, you know, using American liberty as a weapon around the globe and helping out these people and using American soldiers to do these things. Well, of course, as you get into that, if, you're, if your war, if, you're, if your goal is liberation, well, now you're going to be involved in every brush fire that takes place because some people are going to be downtrodden and oppressed, and the United States needs to get involved and start right, lifting these people up. Well, that had never been our foreign policy objective, never. Uh, not until the 1860s, and then not until the late 19th century as well. So it's amazing how uh, our foreign policy uh, shifted after the war, and then when you get to the 20th century, you get a guy like Dean Acheson, who is uh, so interested in this uh, idea of spreading American liberty and democracy, quote-unquote, uh, that we're going to get involved uh, all around the globe, and American soldiers have to die on foreign soils, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of them, uh, for this idea of keeping the world safe from democracy. Now, of course, we had that with the Woodrow Wilson and uh, Franklin Roosevelt in World War II, but the Cold War was something different. Um, you really find this in the neoconservative faction of the Republican Party. Uh, perpetual war for perpetual peace. Um so, as I say in the piece, we're living in a Cold War world without the Cold War. And Atchison was Santa Claus. is the gift it keeps on giving, and Atchison Santa Claus in this case. So, uh, when you look at the basis of American, modern American foreign policy, you have to go back to Yankees. And there are good Northerners. I mean, Atchison was a Yankee, though. Uh, this uh, very aggressive type of Northerner who um, wanted to have this city upon a hill. So, uh, this is the problem with our shift in vision, one from where a more Jeffersonian America ruled the day to a more Lincolnian America or Hamiltonian America, or take your pick for you know whatever uh, centralizer you want to talk about. But that's where the shift comes. Um, the vision changes. And so uh, we have a situation where we have a much more imperialist government, whether it's in foreign or domestic policy, uh, one that is designed to meddle in everything. Uh, you can't even decide what kind of, in your own school uh, district, what kind of lunch to serve your kids at the local public schools because the general government is going to tell you, uh, you know, what, what vegetable you have to have on the plate. Uh, or uh, you can't decide, you can't make your own decisions in terms of your own medical care because there's going to be some type of, you know, federal intervention there. Uh, you know, you can't decide what kind of sign you can have on your highway uh, because there's some type of federal Yankee overlord telling you, well, that sign has to be like this. And uh, the, the, uh, the, <laughs> the federal government, because of the transportation board, or whatever the case may be. So uh, this is what we have. This is, this is Yankee imperialism to a T. It doesn't matter if we're talking about foreign policy or domestic policy. That is the natural result of these things. So we often miss that. That disease of the public mind is Yankee. That's really what it is. It's Yankee. Uh, and if we go back and look at American history in that light, uh, the Puritans as being the basis of all of that, maybe we would change our perspective on what America should do and what America should be. New England is not America. It never has been. The South, the South has always been America. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode of 
uh, the Week in Review in the Abbeville Institute. Until next time, good day. Mm-hmm.